about it. I'm mighty glad about it. Jesus is alive. Thank you, music ministry, and all of its extensions. All of these wonderful musicians and singers have blessed us today. Good to have the Reverend Leona Daniels back in the house. Good to see you, sis. Praise the Lord for you. I was preaching in California a few weeks ago, and she walked over and never came to church. I said, what you doing here? She said, I live here now. I said, what you doing here? Come on back to Texas. And she came on back to help us today, and we praise God for her. Thank God for her. Yeah. Thank God for brother and sister Martin, who blessed us with those beautiful voices this morning. They've gone away. We celebrate them and all those who have shared with us on this Lord's Day. Well, this is an extraordinary day. <laughs> yeah, it's an extraordinary day. And it is not supposed to be celebrated in an ordinary way. We pull out all the stops on Resurrection Sunday. We pull out all the white on Resurrection Sunday. This is no ordinary day. It's an extraordinary day. And every time we gather on Resurrection Sunday, we ought to act like it's an extraordinary day. Amen. Amen. The joy on your faces resemble the extraordinariness of this day. Smiles I've been seeing ever since I showed up in church today resemble an extraordinary day. They tell me you were tailgating in the parking lot this morning <laughs> to make sure you get your seat. Oh, we're pouring coffee for each other, saying, here, baby, have a donut. Because <laughs> this is no ordinary day. The choir, the dancers were here at 3.30 this morning. Not quite, not quite, but it seemed like it. What was it, 6? Yeah, it was early. 5.30, my goodness. That rough, that's, a, that's a rough man right there. 5.30 this morning. Because this is no ordinary day. This is an extraordinary day. And for these moments that we spend together today, as a matter of fact, all day long, I want to look at the 16th chapter of Mark that you heard in its entirety earlier. There are three messages I want to share throughout this day that speak to the extraordinariness of this day. And I want to suggest throughout this day that we ought not leave the empty tomb ordinary <laughs> that we ought not pass by the empty tomb and get so comfortable with the story that we think we know that we miss the fact that God is always up to something when he shows to us his power in our lives so Mark chapter 16 as we make this first installment on this day of celebration I want to look again at this 16th chapter and pull from verse 4 a few words that just might help us with the extraordinariness of this day. Mark chapter 16 at verse 4, the first several words read like this, but when they looked up, that's enough, amen, amen, praise God for his holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, but when they looked up I want to suggest in this seven o'clock service that this day called Resurrection Sunday is a day for looking up it's a day for looking up it's going to happen next Monday a week from tomorrow a week from tomorrow many people will have their gaze toward the skies especially here in Texas because we have the privilege of being benefited by what is a solar eclipse somewhere between the hours of noon and 2 p.m. Across our state, people will be looking up because there's a solar eclipse coming and people want to see the natural phenomenon that will be in the skies. 
on Monday next week, a week from tomorrow, there will be people at Baylor University in the stadium with strange eyeglasses on their faces, <laughs> looking up to see what kind of phenomenon this is really going to be. And it's going to be amazing. As a matter of fact, NASA says it's so amazing that it will not happen for us to see be between before the next 20 years have passed. So if you miss it next Monday, you got to pray that the Lord keeps you around here for another 20 years <laughs> because it will not happen, according to NASA, before another 20 years. A solar eclipse will have everybody looking up. But I came to suggest on this Sunday morning, I rose early on a Sunday morning to tell everybody who was listening that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ eclipses all other events of human history and gives to us an example of the extraordinariness of our God. That whatever happens next Monday will not beat the reality that somewhere over in the Holy Land, there's a tomb that is empty. And it has been empty since that Sunday morning when early on that day, Jesus got up with all power in his hand. And I want to suggest today, brothers and sisters, that you and I always have a reason to look up when we realize that the Lord Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. That you and I never have to walk around in depletion or dejection. We never have to walk around in depression or dismay because we have a Savior who got up with all power in his hand and he gives us a reason to look up. That's literally what that first section of Mark chapter 16 is all about. That in Mark chapter 16, we see the picture of some people who, because of the devastation of their days, had to deal with the reality that dejection and depression, that despair and dismay were the part of their lot in life. These sisters who make their way to the tomb early on Sunday morning are wrestling with the reality that things did not go the way they had planned. Now you've got to catch these sisters. I'll give you their names. One is named Mary Magdalene. The other is Mary, who's the mother of James. And then a third is a sister named Salome. These three women have been with Jesus for an extended period of time. When you read their story, you'll find out, especially in Mark chapter 15, that they were always in place even when others were nowhere to be found these were they who loved and cared for Jesus and they did so with everything that is within them in Mark chapter 15 at verses 40 and 41 you'll find out that on crucifixion Friday they were around the cross and they were watching from a distance as they crucified their Lord and Savior these were the ladies who watched Watch Joseph of Arimathea who begged for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Place that body in a new tomb along with Nicodemus. These three ladies now are at Resurrection Sunday morning, but they don't know what has happened at the tomb. And so they're making their way to the tomb. Don't forget how they're feeling. They're dejected. They're downcast. They're despondent and in dismay because their Lord of glory was crucified on Friday afternoon. Please don't miss it, church, because these women had loved for and cared for Jesus. They had loved and cared for Jesus throughout his ministry. As a matter of fact, these were the sisters who went into their personal resources to make sure that the ministry of the Lord Jesus went forth with great experiences, and they made sure that anything that Jesus needed they would be there to supply it and by the time we get to Friday afternoon these are the women who are watching at a distance I need not tell you that there's some brothers who are nowhere to be found but these sisters 
are right there. They are there around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll come back to that. They are around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are watching from a distance because they have recognized that there's nobody like the Lord. And so they have been blessing him even as he has been blessing them. And now as they get to Sunday morning, the Sabbath has passed for the Jews and now they have been able to go out and buy spices to anoint the body of Jesus. You must understand that Jesus was not embalmed as the Egyptians would embalm bodies. No, Jesus' body as a Jew was to be anointed with spices and aloes. If you were here earlier in the month, you heard me tell you there's a woman in Mark chapter 4 who took her alabaster box, broke it open, and anointed the body of Jesus. And when she did, Jesus says, this woman has anointed me for my burial. Come on, Bible readers. She anointed me for my burial because on Friday there was not enough time for them to take the body down for the cross, anoint that body, wash it as it is supposed to be, ceremonially cleansed, and then entomb it. And so this wees women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they come early in the morning. Yes, that's what the Bible says before, that just after the sun had risen, they came to the seven o'clock service because they wanted to make sure that they got a seat. No, they wanted to make sure that they would be able to take care of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been doing that throughout his three-year ministry and now they want to do it all the more. It is not about embalming. It is about devotion. Mm. It is about care. It is about love. And when you love Jesus, you will go as far as you need to go to show your love for the Lord who has been so good to you. And maybe I'll just pause in the introduction of this message and test the room, test the, the sanctuary, and see is there anybody who sure enough loves the Lord? Is there anybody who showed up on Resurrection Sunday because you love the Lord? I need to make sure I got 100% class participants patient is there anybody who loves my Jesus <laughs> These women want to show their love and devotion for Jesus Christ. And so they make their way, church family, to the tomb. They are, watch it, dejected. They are despondent. They are filled with dismay. Depression is setting in because the Lord that they love so much had been crucified on Friday. And while they're going to anoint his body, you got to see what they ask one another. While they're making their way, way to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Athena, these women ask one another, who's going to roll the stone away? Yeah, they understand that they have limited capacity in their physicality and they also understand that this stone, this mammoth stone has been placed at the mouth of the tomb and they cannot easily get it off. They cannot easily remove it. They cannot easily enter the tomb and if that wasn't bad enough, they've sealed that stone to make sure that nobody took the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have sealed it and made it secure and these women are walking and wondering who is going to roll the stone away in the midst of their dismay, in the midst of their depression, in the midst of their devastation. They ask one another, who's going to roll the stone away? That's what's happening between verses 1 and 3 and then at verse 4, your body Bible says, but when they looked up, oh man, I just set that up for the past five minutes and there's some of y'all who caught it, others y'all who looking at me like, what? What do you mean, huh? What up? I said today, Rita, it's good to see you. I said today that these women are walking and wondering how are things going to work out? How are things going to get taken care of? How are things going to pan out in my situation? It's been devastating. It's been disastrous. I've been in dismay as a consequence 
consequence of the reality of my last days and they're wondering how is next week going to work out? How is next month going to work out? How is the rest of this day going to work out? And your Bible says that as a consequence of their wondering, according to the context of the text, they're looking down because when you're in dismay you're downcast when you're in dismay you keep your eyes glanced toward that which is beneath you not before you isn't it interesting when things aren't going your way all you can see is the negativity of your situation all you can think about is how bad the circumstance really is and I came today to talk to somebody at the Wheeler Avenue Church and tell you no matter what happened in January February or March you have made it to the 31st day of March and I came to implore you and invite you and encourage you to stop looking down and start looking up. I need 10 people in here who say I refuse to keep walking around in demoralization and dismay. I believe that if I lift up my glance I'll be able to see something that I would never be able to see if I keep on looking down. Bible says I feel like preaching. I ain't preached here in three weeks. The Bible says that when they looked up, something shifted. When they looked up, something changed. When they looked up, they recognized something different. May I suggest three things in our consider for our consideration today that just might happen when we look up and we'll make our way to brunch. Is there anybody in church? Act like you ain't going. Come on now. Is there anybody in church today? who understands that something happens when you look up. I want to submit in the first place that when you look up, watch this, God will replace our misery with his mystery. Uh, God will replace our misery with his mystery. Somebody say mystery. I like that word. I like that word mystery. I, I'm at the point now, Deacon and Charlotte Bryant, I'm at the place now where I, I don't need to know everything. I, I'm at a place now that I'm comfortable with, with not knowing everything, <laughs> especially when it comes to the things of God. Because when I was a seminary student, most of our seminary classmates were like this. We wanted to know everything about God. We wanted to read everything, know everything, and impress one another with everything we knew. And when you're a seminary student, most likely, maybe not all of them, but some of us were always trying to make sure we could one-up one another with how much we know. We know this and we know that. I'm at the place now, Reverend Preston Allen. I ain't trying to impress nobody with what I know. Let me tell you what I know. I know God is good. I know God heals. I know God forgives. I know God delivers. Everything else, that's up to God. I ain't got nothing else to do with it. I know he saves. I know he saves. I know he saves. I don't need to know everything. I don't need to impress anybody by what I know. I know what I know. I share what I share. But one thing I know is that I can't beat God being God. Oh, mercy. And I don't always know how God is going to operate. I just trust God to do what only God can do. And I need seven people in here who are not trying to put God in a box every five days and say, God, you got to do it like this. You got to do it like that. If you don't do it like that, it won't be done. I need somebody to free God and free yourself from trying to play God and begin to testify any way you bless me, Lord. I'll be satisfied. Uh. Uh, Dr. Angela, it, it, it is what we, they taught us when they taught us about Rudolf Otto. He's a theologian, great thinker of the 20th century. Rudolf Otto came up with a beautiful phrase, a Latin phrase, Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinant. <laughs> yeah, I, I did learn something. Yeah. Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinant. It literally suggests that God is wholly other, that God is not, uh, is not limited to our boxes, our self-prescribed ways of doing what God has has to do that God all by God's self is a tremendous mystery I don't care how much Sunday school you go to you'll never know everything about God doesn't matter if you sit in the same seat every Sunday at the same service you'll never know everything about God 
and we ought to stop trying to tell people how God is going to operate and how God is going to do and what God is going to do and when God is going to do it because then you try to put yourself in the place of God and somebody ought to testify, let God be God because if God is God, God, God helps us to live in the mysterious areas of life. That God is mystery. That when you think you know God, then you try to play God. That's why you ought to let God be God now. And so God is mystery. And God is a tremendous mystery. That God is wholly other. And, and Otto says that when you recognize God in God's complete Godness, your first response is silence. That I can't say anything because I don't even have the words that are, that are appropriate to dispeak, to bespeak the awesomeness of God. That God is wholly other. That God is in a class all by God's self. That God does whatever God chooses to do, which is why we call God sovereign. Which is why we choose to stand in awe of the tremendous nature of God. That, that, God, that God responds to us, but we never know exactly how God's going to respond to us. So instead of trying to tell God what to do, we respond in silence. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in all the earth. Uh, the, the Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. That is the initial response that we come to God in holy awe and in reverence and we are silent. But then we recognize there is terror that is attached to God. That we recognize that God could snatch us up and get rid of us at any point in time because we offend the heart of God. Every one of us in here who has sinned has offended the heart of God and as a consequence, God could have wiped us out immediately. And so there is a bit of terror that comes to us. But then this is fascinant. It literally means that I'm fascinated by this God because this God, although he could wipe me out, he gives me compassion and mercy and grace that I so enough don't expect or, or, or deserve. Is there anybody in church this afternoon, this morning, who can get happy about the fact that despite the reality that we don't deserve the grace, the mercy, the compassion, and the care of God because God is in a class all by himself God does what he chooses to do and we're alive in worship this morning because the mysterious tremendous who is God has given us yet another chance he's a wonder in my soul there's nobody who can do what God can do the way God can do it and so they're wondering who's gonna roll the stone away and while they're wondering, with their gla glance downward, they make the decision to look up. Come on and help me. I hear you. I hear you helping me preach. And when they look up, watch, they realize that the stone has already been rolled away. Woo. Oh, I need somebody to encourage somebody on your row and begin to testify. As you look back over your life, there were some days you were wondering, trying to figure out how things were going to work out. You were scratching your head, trying to figure out if God was really on your side. But you are in this place today to testify that when you looked up, he had already worked that thing out. He had already granted you victory, already given you deliverance. I need somebody who has watched God make a way out of no way to testify. I refuse to keep looking down because every time I look up he shows me he's still in control he shows me he's still on my side he shows me he still fights my battle is there anybody in here who can testify when I look up he replaces my misery with his mystery so no I can't tell you when God's gonna show up I can't tell you how God's gonna show up I can't tell you through what measure God's going to work it out. But I do know that God is still God. And because God is still God, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. And is there anybody in church this Resurrection Sunday who can testify, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Hey, hey, up in that balcony, while you trying to figure it out, 
<laughs> He's already working it out. Is there a believer in this church? And I want to suggest that when we look up, God will replace our misery with his mystery. Can I go farther? Because I want to suggest in the second place that when we look up, God will reveal the miraculous through a message. Uh, God will reveal the miraculous. Somebody say miraculous. He's still a miracle worker. I need you to hear me. That God will reveal the miraculous through a message. It's not always bells and whistles, thunder and lightning. Every now and then, God just sends a word in your direction to let you know, I see where you are. I know what you need. I got you. Stop stressing. Stop, stop tripping. I know exactly what you need. And so every now and then, God will send them. So they get to the tomb, these women do. And when they get to the tomb, they, they see that the stone has already been rolled away. My God. And when they recognize that the stone has already been rolled away, they go in. And when they go in, they see a young man dressed in a white robe. And this young man dressed in a white robe, according to Matthew, is an angel that has been sent from God. And uh, this angel has a message from them. Now, they were looking down, but when they looked up, they were able to see that there is an angel in a white robe. I need somebody to look up. There's a young man in a white robe. Why y'all laughing? Still young. There's a young man in a white robe. And that young man has a message for everybody who showed up on Resurrection Sunday. This message is not just for your cousin that you wish was here. This message is not just for your boss who needs to be listening. This message is for everybody who showed up at Resurrection Sunday. Here's the message. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Oh, I know you know you know the message. I know, but every now and then we need to hear that message again. And if that was the first part of the message, that'd be great, but that's not the first part of the message. The first part of the message goes like this. Don't be alarmed. Um, literally, the, the angel says to the folk who showed up on Resurrection Sunday, relax. Now, that didn't catch as your word. I need you to catch it because sometimes you're a little more stressed than you need to be when you call yourself a child of God. Sometimes you're tripping more than you need to be when you call yourself a child of God. Sometimes you're worried about entirely too much and it's zapping you of your strength, zapping you of your energy, zapping you of your vitality. And every now and then, a young man with a white robe has to show up and say, relax. Calm yourself down. Get off that ledge. Stop stressing. Stop pacing the floor at night. Get in the bed. Go to sleep. Pull the covers up over your head and believe that the same God of the morning hours is the God of the night hours and he is working the night shift on your behalf to prove that there is nothing he will not do to take care of his children. Can I find somebody in here who is able to testify? I don't understand everything, but I'm going to trust God anyway. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to trust God anyway. I don't know when the job is going to come through, but I'm going to trust God anyway. I don't know where the finances are going to come from, but I'm going to trust God anyway. I don't like the diagnosis, but I'm going to trust God anyway. I don't like the family friction, but I'm going to trust God anyway. My mind is playing tricks on me, but I'm going to trust God anyway. My friends have walked out on me, but I'm going to trust God anyway. Somebody shout, relax. relax. Tell yourself, not your pew partner. Don't look around now. Don't tell, no, no. Don't touch your neighbor. Tell yourself, relax. And those who did not say it, you are proving that you don't want to hear a word that the Lord has to say in your direction. I need you to tell yourself, your Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue and we eat the fruit thereof. I need 100% class participation. Let the church say, relax. I'm, I'm intrigued by the words of scripture. 
The scripture says that we can cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. I'm blessed by the words of scripture. It tells us to pray without ceasing. And then Philippians says when we do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It literally will guard your heart and mind. It does not mean that there's not the absence of chaos. Yes, chaos is all around, but some kind of way God knows how to guard our hearts and give us a peace that passes all understanding. May I find seven people who have watched the Lord do that for you. You're living in a tumultuous time and you still got peace. You're living in a time where you can't find out the answers, figure out the answers, and you still have peace. You're living in a situation that you can't explain by yourself but you still have peace still got a smile on your face still clapping your hands in worship still believing God for great things is there anybody in here who just holler relax why should I relax because he is risen he's not here he's risen and if God can get up a dead Jesus God can handle your financial strain. God can handle your, your physical ailment. God can handle whatever it is you're dealing with right now. And so he says he's not here. He's risen just as he said. Now watch the scriptures, church, because after he said that, after they said, he said, don't be alarmed, don't be affrighted, King James Version. He says, you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. See for yourself. Look for yourself. Watch God show you for yourself. Now you need to understand. You need to go and tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you in the Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. He says, I want you to relax, but I also want you to know he is risen. And when you recognize that, you ought to be able to rejoice. Um, okay. It's getting around the room like the wave at a ballpark. It's slow, but it's show. He says when you are able to relax and you realize he is risen, it gives you reason to rejoice. He is not here. They thought they had him bound. They thought they had him done. They thought that it was over for him, but he is not here. He is risen as he told you. Now go tell his disciples and Peter to meet him over in Galilee. Now I like this. I'm almost done. I got to close the message. Time on the wall says I got seven minutes left to preach this last point. You think I'm going to make it? I don't either. I got 10 minutes left. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. I want to suggest, church family, that you and I ought to be excited on this day. It's not an, ex it's not an ordinary day. It's an extraordinary day. It's so extraordinary, church, that God will replace our misery with his mystery. And then your God is so amazing that God well, watch this. He will reclaim the mistaken by his majesty. Um, um, uh, after he reveals a message, uh, the, the miraculous through a message, he will reclaim the mistaken with his majesty, by his majesty. I'm, I'm still in your Bible because if you heard me just a moment ago, you heard me read uh, that, that seventh verse because the angel told these women, go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. All right, Reverend Lakeisha Barnett, uh, uh, to pray for you, she caught it real fast because she's one of them Bible scholars. That's why she over there hollering because she understands that all the brothers deserted him. On Friday, all his disciples saved John fled the scene. John is the only one around the cross who stayed to take care of the mother of Jesus who is Mary. And every one of those other 11 disciples, 10 of them fled the scene because they couldn't take the heat when it got hot in the kitchen. And so I told you that the women, chapter 15, were watching at a distance. I told you that the women were watching when they took the body down and laid it in Joseph's new tomb. And now the women show up on Resurrection Sunday. And uh, when the women get there on Resurrection Sunday, since there are no men to spread the news.
<laughs> don't get mad, brothers. Don't get mad. It is what it is. It is what it is. Since there are no men to spread the news, now the women have to get the message that Jesus is risen from the grave and the women go preaching it first. If I'm making it up, you tell me where it is in the Bible. It's right there. The angel says, you go tell the men who fled the scene to meet Jesus in Galilee. That's why he said he was going to meet him in chapter 14. He said, listen, when I'm risen from the dead, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. And apparently, they had forgotten what he said. They fled the scene except John. And now all the brothers have gone their separate ways. And now it is incumbent upon the sisters to go tell the disciples exactly that the Lord has arrived, has, has risen from the dead. Now, now, church, this blesses me because it is not just a dig on the brothers. It is to show the faithfulness of God. Because God is not simply faithful to us when we're faithful to him. But even when we make mistakes that we claim we never would have made, God says, I love you too much to leave you on the outs of a relationship with me, but I will do whatever it takes to reclaim you and bring you back in and let you know that you're still my child. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jesus chose those 12 men at the beginning of his ministry. He lost one who was Judas, but he still said, I got place for these 11, even after they made more mistakes than I care for anybody to know about. And I need somebody in church who is excited on a Sunday morning that no matter how many mistakes you have made the Lord you love is able to reclaim you to restore you to redeem you and give you another chance don't talk about who else is in your family talk about yourself right now and begin to testify I've made more mistakes than I want anybody in church to know about but I'm grateful on resurrection Sunday that when I look up I realize he looked beyond my faults and saw my need Can I find six people in here who are still excited that he looked beyond your fault and saw your need? Anybody who's still excited that the Lord loves you so much that there is no mistake you can make that will make him give up on you? Oh, you're missing it, church family. Because if you were catching it, you'd be jumping all over this church house because you recognize just how much your Lord loves you. Because he did not just say, go tell my disciples. He said, go tell my disciples and Peter. Now, every year I read this story and it gets me happy every year like it did the last year. Because everybody in here knows that Peter is a disciple. So why did he have to add the conjunctive phrase and Peter because Peter was the ride or die brother. Peter was the brother who jumped and shouted every time church got started. Peter was the guy who was teaching Sunday school. Peter was the guy who had a clergy collar around his neck and Peter was the one who walked out on Jesus after he said I'll never leave you. I'll never walk out on you. I'll never act ugly with you and he did it anyway. He had a responsibility on his life but but he still messed up more times than we want to talk about. And I need to talk to the people in the room today. You've been saved for an extended period of time. And in March, you messed up. You've been saved for a long time. And since January, you've done some silly stuff. I need to talk to the people in church today. You got a title and you still do silly things. But I came today to tell you that no matter how bad it's been, you got a Jesus who reclaims the those who have been lost who shows up and says come on back in here I have not forgotten about you I have not looked past you I still love you and I need every Peter in the building who can testify you made some mistakes that you don't want your children to know about you made some mistakes you don't want your mama and them to ever find out about 
but you're in church on a Sunday morning because the resurrection says you don't have to look down you don't have to look around you can look up to that man named Jesus and he will do the amazing he will do the phenomenal he will do the extraordinary I'm trying to close the message I got a few seconds left but the Bible says I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which coming my help my help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth he will not suffer thy foot to be moved he that keepeth thee will not slumber behold he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep the Lord is thy keeper the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand the sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil he shall preserve thy soul he shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore so I need somebody to stop looking around you stop looking down in front of you stop looking at your past behind you I need you to look toward that man named Jesus look up and see he's still working on you he still believes in you he still got plans for you he's still doing great things in your life is there anybody in this building who's been looking down too long and you making up in your mind I'm gonna look up I'm gonna look higher I'm going to go higher is there anybody who will help me close the bar says looking unto Jesus the author